great to have our visitors here. We're glad that you're a part of us this morning, and we hope that you will stay for our Bible classes, and then after that, stay a little bit longer so we can get to know you just a little bit better. If you have any questions about the faith and practice here of the uh, church that assembles in this building, feel free to ask us, and we will turn to the Bible for an answer. I would like to announce this morning, I have authority to announce this, that uh, James Gumbert has asked that his name be taken away from consideration in the eldership. He has considered some things, and he wishes to uh, remove that name from consideration at this time. We appreciate so very much James Gumbert and his family. As we've said in the past, to even be considered to be an elder speaks very well, not only of that man, but of his family as well. So we know that James will continue to grow and that he will continue to be an asset to this congregation as he has in the past and will continue to do so in the future. Remember, tonight uh, Jack Titlow will be staying after services for those who will uh, talk to him and want to visit with him. His name was put forth as one of the elders of this congregation. And we want to encourage everyone to take advantage of these opportunities to talk to these men. Uh, we do know that there are some who believe that there are no men here qualified. If you believe that, you need to talk to these men who are staying after and tell them why. And therefore, we hope that you will avail yourself of those opportunities. And if you believe that they are qualified, you can go back there and you can talk to them and uh, talk uh, and encourage them in this endeavor as well. We want to do things according to the Bible. Therefore, that's why we take very seriously the qualifications found in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1. We do not want to cut corners just for the sake of having an eldership. We must do things according to God's will. The Christian's responsibility to civil government. That's what I want to talk about this morning. What should be our response and our obligation to civil government? And I also want to tie in the hot topic that's in our society today, which is illegal immigration. You've probably heard about it in the news. You probably have read about it in the newspaper, probably seen it on the Internet, the controversial law in Arizona, and all of the hoop law, the anger that people have towards that, the anger of people who are religious towards that, the anger of people who are religious who claim to believe the Bible towards that issue of illegal immigration. We want to answer this morning, what is the Christian's responsibility to civil government? And then we're going to make practical application, not only to our own lives, but to that subject of illegal immigration. We have to understand that as a people, we're not against immigration. Probably everyone here are descendants of immigrants to this nation. But the key word in that phrase is illegal. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Hopefully there will be some things said this morning that will help you in these discussions that you have at work or that you have at school or other places about this very issue. Christians are citizens of a dual society, so to speak. We are part of an earthly nation, but we're also part of a heavenly nation. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20, Paul says, Our citizenship is in heaven. We are citizens of heaven. It is a spiritual kingdom of which we are a part of. When we believed and obeyed the gospel, when we were baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, we became part of the kingdom of God's dear Son. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13, we were, we were translated out of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. And in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, John writes by inspiration and says that the blood of Christ has washed us and made us a kingdom of priests. In Revelation 1 and verse 9, John tells us that we are in the kingdom. Therefore, we are a part of the church of Christ Christ. 
which is the kingdom of God on earth. Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, that we are pilgrims and sojourners on the earth. And as we are pilgrims and sojourners, as we consider the song that we sometimes sing, this world is not our home, we're just passing through. Because we are pilgrims and sojourners, we have to recognize that we are in a foreign land, so to speak. Yes, we are citizens of an earthly nation, but we are just passing through. We are pilgrims. This is, a not, this is not our permanent home. We understand from the teaching of the Bible that there is a realm beyond this physical realm. We will all pass through that veil someday. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. And therefore, as a result, we recognize that even though we are in the world, we're not of the world. However, we are in the world. And Jesus recognized that in Luke chapter 20, verses 20 through 26, when Jesus was challenged by those who said, should we render unto Caesar his tribute? Should we pay taxes? They wanted to trap Jesus and try to get him in a dilemma, in a corner. And Jesus said, bring me a coin. And they brought him a coin. And he said, whose image and superscription is on the coin? And they said, Caesar's. And Jesus said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And you render unto God the things that are God's. Jesus recognized that we live in an earthly realm. Even though our citizenship is in heaven, we have a responsibility to the earthly realm that we exist in. So we are to render unto Caesar, render unto the government that which is due the government, and of course render unto God that which is due to God. Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13 as Paul is writing to the Christians at Rome, we see that God is telling His people to respect the authority and the government that they are in. As Paul began in Romans chapter 12 to give the practical aspect of the epistle, after in verses, or excuse me, chapters 1 through 11 of Romans, after he talked about how that we are saved by faith through the grace and mercy of God, verses 12 through 16 of the book of Romans, Paul is now telling us this is how you are to act as a person of faith. This is how you are to conduct yourself as a person that's been justified by faith. Romans chapter 13, let's look at verse 1. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. Why? For there is no authority except from God... And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Here we see Paul telling us, you be subject to the governing authorities. Now keep in mind the time period in which Paul is writing. He is not writing to Christians who live in a government like we have today. It was tyrannical. It was a dictatorship. It was much more corrupt than our nation. Now our nation is heading that direction, but it's not there yet. The Roman Empire was far more wicked than our nation today. And yet Paul admonishes, he commands the Christians to be subject to the governing authorities. And he says, here's the reason why. Four, here's the reason why. There is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. In other words, government would not exist if God did not appoint government to exist. Now that certainly does not mean that every government is just. That certainly does not mean that every government is doing what's right. But the powers that be are because God has ordained those powers to be. You know, in the book of Genesis, we read about how the human race began to multiply upon the face of the earth. And probably there were nations before the flood. We simply don't have a record of those different nations or what they were called. But when the nations multiplied upon the face of the earth before the flood, God saw the wickedness of man and he decided to destroy uh, the human race except for Noah and those on the ark. 
When you read Genesis chapter 9, you see that God gives laws and regulations to Noah. Those are your first basic forms of government there. Genesis chapter 9. And as we see in Genesis chapter 9, there were certain things that men were supposed to be engaged in, certain things men were not supposed to do. And in fact, in Romans chapter 9, you see that God institutes the death penalty. We will talk about the death penalty a little bit later on. So we see that God has ordained government. Of course, when God chose His own special people, He gave them a government. In the book of Exodus, they were taken out of uh, Egyptian bondage, taken to Mount Sinai. God gave them the Ten Commandments plus 600 other uh, commandments, 600 plus other commandments on top of the Ten Commandments that you read about in the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses. And those were the laws for that society, for the nation of Israel. God wants His government to be ordained. Daniel chapter 2, verses 20 through 21, we see that Daniel reminds Nebuchadnezzar, a wicked monarch in the Babylonian Empire, he reminds him that God rules in the kingdoms of men. God rules. God is in control in the kingdoms of men. Now, of course, Nebuchadnezzar was not submitting to God's rule and would be punished as a result of his pride You read that a little bit later on in the book of Daniel. But God governs in the kingdoms of men. He reminds them of that in Daniel 4, 17 and also in Daniel chapter 4, verse 25 and 32. God is the one who is the appointer of government. Even those nations and those governments that are evil, which God often uses for His divine purposes, He will raise them up and He will replace them for a greater good. We read about that, of course, in the book of Exodus. Why did God allow the Egyptian empire to raise up? Why did He allow them to rise up and through their freedom of choice do what they did? So that He could demonstrate His power by rescuing His people out of their bondage. God's in control. And we see other empires like the Assyrians, Isaiah chapter uh, 10, how that God would use the Assyrians to accomplish His will, even though they were a wicked, violent people, God would use the Assyrians to accomplish His will, then He would cut them down. As an axeman would go out and cut down a forest. God is in control. So we see here that our responsibility, Romans chapter 13 and verse 1, let every soul be subject to the governing authority because that authority comes from God. Look at verse 2 of Romans chapter 13. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on himself. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister or servant to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's servant and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For because of this you pay taxes, for they are God's servants, attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, custom to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. So we see here in Romans chapter 13, if you resist the government, you are resisting what God has ordained, therefore that would be sinful. Those, as I said at the beginning of the sermon, who who claim to be religious, who are resisting the government, who want to take up arms against the government, who want to break laws and live in a lawless manner, and then they hold the Bible in their hand... Have they not read Romans chapter 13? Now there is an exception to that. We understand that exception. Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 5. When 
the government tells you to do something that's contrary to God's will, then we must obey God rather than men. If we had a law that causes us to violate the will of God, we have to or violate God's will, we would have to obey God's will because it supersedes man's will. And some nations that are communist, I believe it's China, they have, I believe it's a two-child minimum. And if they have another child, they have to have an abortion. It's state mandatory. A Christian couldn't do that. A Christian would have to resist the authority because that would be the killing of an unborn child. And therefore, Christians in that society have to face persecution from the government as a result of what the Bible says. They're not going to kill their unborn child simply because the government says you can only have two kids and that's it. That's a violation of clear-cut passages in the Word of God. Therefore, we would resist, as the apostles were told in Acts 4 and Acts 5, you don't preach Christ anymore. We have to preach Christ. Therefore, we would have to resist that law and not do what man says. We should obey God rather than man. So we see here in Romans chapter 13 that they are servants of God. They don't even have to be Christians, but they could still be servants of God in this sense of the government. Verse 3, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. And he gives a very simple principle here. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good and you'll have praise from the same. If you live a good Christian life, you don't have to be concerned when the police officer drives down the road. What would you have to be concerned about? There's nothing to be concerned about when you see a police officer out in public or those in authority because you're living a good Christian life. If you do good, you will have praise from the same. Verse 4, for he is God's servant to you for good. That is the ultimate purpose of government. Again, there are some governments that are not good. But if governments are trying to do what's right to benefit their society and humanity, they will do what is good. But if you do evil, be afraid. If you break the laws, then you have something to be afraid of. For he does not bear the sword in vain. Bearing the sword. This has reference to the use of deadly force. The government has the right to use deadly force. Does that mean a police officer can use deadly force in enforcing the laws? Yes. Does that mean a sniper in a situation where there is a, a kidnapping situation, it's a dangerous situation, could a sniper use the skills that he has to end the life of an evildoer that's causing much harm? Yes. They do not bear the sword in vain. Sword here represents the use of deadly force. What do you do with the sword? Swords were used for chopping off heads. Swords were used for executing people. Therefore, the sword here represents the use of deadly force when necessary. Remember what I said at the beginning of the sermon. God ordained the death penalty. It amazes me how many religious people who claim to believe the Bible are against the death penalty. God ordained the death penalty. In Genesis chapter 9, he says, If you shed man's blood, then your blood should be shed. And under the law of Moses, when that law was given to Israel, there were 16 crimes that were punishable by the death penalty. Crimes like adultery, homosexuality, kidnapping, rape. Can you imagine how many people in our society would be dead if we implemented that today? We wouldn't have a problem with overcrowding in our jail system. And you would not have repeat offenders either. Because if you're executed for the crimes you commit, you're not going to commit them again. It's a permanent solution to a person who refuses to play by the rules. Now, I do believe, as Kevin last week pointed out, Kevin Pendergrass, that there can be people on death row who can go to the death chamber in a saved condition. They can believe and obey the gospel and be right with God as they're sticking that needle in their arm and executing them. 
but they have to pay the price for their sins. So we see here that God authorizes the use of deadly force in punishing those who do evil. And therefore, he says, it's God's avenger, it's God's way in the providence in this world to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must, verse 5, be subject, not only because of wrath, not only because you could be punished, but also for conscience sake. If you violate the laws of the land, even though you don't get caught, that will harden your conscience. That's why I, I don't understand why Christians would have a radar detector in their automobile. I don't understand that. Why would a Christian need a radar detector? If you're going to do what the law of the land says, you don't have to be worried about getting caught by a cop or getting a ticket. I don't understand why a Christians would violate the seatbelt laws. I remember when the seatbelt laws came out the first time back when I was a teenager. I just started driving. I grew up, you didn't have to have a seat belt. You could lay anywhere in the car you wanted. And we talk about those good old days where you could lay anywhere in the car you wanted, and that's great and wonderful, but things have changed. The laws have changed. And so because I was a Christian and because I didn't want to get tickets, I submitted to God's will and started wearing my seat belt. Now they've got a new law, a booster seat for the kids that are under a certain height, under a certain age. I think it's silly. But you know what? I'm going to do it. Because it's the law of the land. And therefore, because of conscience sake, I'm going to obey that law. And just because we may not get caught or get a ticket or, 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 or we may get away with it as far as human consequences are concerned, God is watching. We're un, always under some surveillance with God. We talk about our society being a surveillance society, cameras everywhere. God's always watching us. And therefore, when we come to that stop sign, we should stop. It doesn't matter if it's 3 o'clock in the morning and there's no one around. When the sign says stop, God is watching us at 3 o'clock in the morning, we should stop. Why? It's the right thing to do. I wish I had a dollar for every person I see here in Roy City that runs those stop signs. I could retire as a wealthy man. The simple concept of coming to a stop, our society, people fight against that. So we need to have an attitude of, I'm going to submit to the law. I may not agree that the, the law says it's 35 miles an hour on this road. I might want to go 65. Doesn't matter what I feel. Doesn't matter what I think. The Bible says you submit and you try to the best of your ability to abide within the speed limits and the traffic laws, the hunting laws, or whatever law it may be. And therefore, we are to obey for conscience sake, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. Verse 6, for because of this you also pay taxes. We are to pay taxes. For they are God's servants attending, attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Now, let's look at what Peter says on this. 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. Beginning... <clears throat> In verse 13, after talking about how that we are uh, pilgrims and we are to conduct ourselves honorably in the verse 11 and 12, he makes practical application of that. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 13. Therefore, submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors or to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free, yet not using your liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Again, when you read this, 
And it's amazing to me how that Peter is writing this by inspiration under a dictator like Nero. Roman Emperor Nero, very wicked man. Several apostles died at his hand. Perhaps Peter and Paul were the ones who were executed by this man's uh, rule. But he says, honor them. You honor them. Why? It's God's will. It's God's will. And I think this is a good message for us as, as citizens of a free country. Verse 16, as free, yet not using your liberty as a cloak for vice. Is that not the problem in our country? We have freedom, but it's turned into vice. It's called art. Pornography, wickedness, called art. That's vice. Things that are, are, are an abomination to God. Things that are clearly set forth as immoral, as murder, abortion, homosexuality. That freedom has turned into vice in a free society. But we see here that we're to submit to every ordinance of man, verse 13, for the Lord's sake. That means because God told us to. We are to be law-abiding citizens. As a result of that, we should be the best citizens of any nation except when that nation tells us to violate God's will. Then we ought to obey God rather than man. But if the laws are in harmony with uh, the scriptures and the laws do not violate anything clear-cut in the word of God, we should obey them, whether we like them or not. Now, what is our responsibility to the government? Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. Look at what Paul tells Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Can we help the situation? Can we help the situation that we live in? The answer is yes. 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Beginning in verse 1. Therefore I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. For kings and those who are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Here's what we can do to change things for the better. And we'll talk about voting in a little bit later on. But here's what we can do right here. Even in a society where you didn't have a vote, as Paul was in that society where he didn't have a vote who was going to be the leader, here's what he could do. He says, you make prayers and supplications and intercessions on behalf of all men, kings, those who are in authority, that what? We may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. We should be praying for our president and our vice president and those in the Senate. It doesn't matter if you voted for them or not. We should be praying for them, for their protection. We should be praying that they will look to the Word of God with a sincere and honest heart and change their policies that it might be more in harmony with God's will instead of less as it is now. So this is what we can do. We can pray. And verse 3 says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Why? He desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. When we have peace in a society and we have godliness prevailing with all reverence towards God, That is a society in which the gospel can flourish. That's why Christians and churches of Christ outnumber uh, the churches of Christ throughout the world. There's, There's a higher concentration of churches of Christ and Christians in the United States of America than all the rest of the world combined because of the society that we're in. We have the freedom to preach and to convert and to assemble. Other nations don't have that freedom. Now that might change. And that goes to my next point. We do have the blessed privilege of not only praying, but voting. We have the blessed privilege, as few on earth in the history of mankind have ever had, of changing the course of who will lead our nation. So we need to think very carefully when we see someone up for a public office. We need to consider and scrutinize very carefully where do they stand on the moral issues. 
and vote in harmony with God's will. But we can pray anytime, anywhere for those who are currently in leadership. Now, let's make practical application to the immigration problem. As we said at the beginning of the lesson, we're not against immigration. All of us are descendants of immigrants to one extent or another. The problem with the issue at hand is illegal immigration. The key word there is illegal. The moment people step over the border, whether it's Mexicans down south, British people up north, Irish people to the east or the west, it matters not. The moment they step over the border in an illegal fashion, not going through the proper chain of command and going through the proper authorities, they have broken the law. They are criminals. And we've seen what the Bible says concerning that. They have to face the consequence of their crime. Just like if I go out and I commit a crime, I'm going to have to face the consequence of my action. So by stepping over the border in an illegal fashion, they enter into this country and become criminals by virtue of that very act. And some people argue out of compassion and say, well, if you, if you send them back, sometimes they will be separated from their children, separated from their spouse. And I understand that's a problem. That's a dilemma. But think about this. If I go out and commit a crime and I'm convicted and I go to jail, I'm separated from my family. And I brought it on myself. Sometimes the innocent have to suffer when people do wicked things. And according to the Bible, it is wicked to violate the laws of a nation. And therefore, those who come over, they are coming over illegally. They are criminals. Now, I understand that they want to come for a better life. I understand that, and I can sympathize with that. I've been to third world countries. I know what it's like. However, you have to play by the rules. It is not fair for those who have come through, through the proper channels and have become citizens, for them to have to stand in line and go through the process and then everyone else cut in line. And for people to be outraged who are religious, who claim to believe in this, they need to open it up once again. Not only did Jesus talk about love, not only did Jesus talk about compassion, not only did Jesus talk about uh, forgiveness, but he also talked about submitting to the government. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. So these institutions that call themselves churches that harbor, that harbor illegal aliens are violating God's will. Of course, we know they don't have respect for God's will in other areas. So why would they respect Romans 13 or 1 Peter chapter 2? We have to understand that even though we have to approach the situation with compassion and love, that people have to face the consequence of their wrongdoings. Can a person who's in jail for the crimes they've committed, can they be forgiven? Can, can they go to heaven? Yes, but they might have to die in jail. God will forgive the sin, but he will not remove the consequence. Remember what Nathan said to David? The sword will never depart from your, from your house. Your sin is forgiven you, but the sword will never depart from your family. You're going to have trouble for the rest of your days for the sin you committed with Bathsheba and against Uriah. David was forgiven, but he had to face the consequence of his sins. So we must put into practical application what the Bible says here concerning immigration, concerning any law. We must obey. We must, if we have a voice, let our voice be made, let our voice be heard. We can do that at the voting booth. We can write. We can email. We can, we can make a difference. But if none of that has a change and does anything positive, we can still pray. Perhaps there's someone here this morning that needs to obey the gospel and become a part of the spiritual kingdom, which is the church. We urge you to be born of water and the Spirit. Believe in Christ. Confess Him as the Son of God and repent of your sins. Be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll be a citizen of heaven. If you've done that and gone astray, we urge you to repent.
Come back to the Lord. As always, the choice is yours while we stand and sing.